you asked, I answered. Lauren contacted me after coming across my YouTube channel where I talk about converting one bedroom apartments into two bedroom apartments in London using my B4R property investing model. Hi Ravinda, my name is Lauren. I'm a complete beginner in property and I would love to learn more about your B4R model. She had been researching this strategy and apparently my channel provides the best content on this subject. So thank you, Lauren. These are some of the results my B4R property investing model has allowed me to achieve. I have been able to buy on average nearly three times the number of apartments compared to the traditional way of property investing. The average uplift created, so this is the difference between what I purchased the apartment for and what it got valued at, has been £105,000. And that's having only owned the apartment for six months. The cash flow has been supercharged because I'm now renting out a two bedroom flat and not a one bedroom flat. The average return on investment has been 21%. That's nearly three times the return a normal investor would be earning based on investing the traditional way and the way I used to invest. Lauren had some really interesting and intriguing questions that she wanted my help with and so I thought it would be more fun and exciting if I did a video answering these questions. So big shout out to Lauren for getting in touch. I'm sure lots of people will have exactly the same questions you have asked. Please do me a quick favour and hit that subscribe button. It helps me more than you think. I'm all about the data and YouTube tells me that 77.6% of my viewers are not even subscribed. So please smash that subscribe button. If you guys do have any questions about my B4R property investing model, please comment them down below and I will try and make a video on them like I did for Lauren. Hi Ravinda, hope you are well. I came across your YouTube channel and have been wanting to convert one bedroom apartments into two bedroom apartments in London for a while now. I've been researching the strategy and your channel provides the best content on the subject. I have a few questions if you don't mind answering them. Does this strategy just work for converting one bed flat into two bed flats? Or can it work by converting two beds into three beds, three into four, etc.? Excellent question, Lauren. I actually explored this early on when I was looking to convert one bedroom apartments into two bedroom apartments in central London. There were two main reasons I decided to convert one bedroom apartments into two bedroom apartments. There were lots of one bedroom apartments available for sale. So lots of properties for me to look at to see if they ticked the boxes on my criteria checklist. There were lots of two bedroom sold comparables so that I could bed down the end value of my apartment once I converted it from a one bedroom apartment into a two bedroom apartment. The problem or issue I found when looking at converting two bedroom flats into three bedroom flats was that three bedroom flats were less common and so finding sold comparables provided a lot more challenging both in terms of three beds on the market and sold. This introduced a lot of uncertainty when it came to working out the end value of the three bedroom apartment and therefore made me very nervous especially when looking to do a number of these projects at the same time. I actually started off by looking to convert studio apartments into one bedroom apartments. The reason I started off this way was that the studio apartments were cheaper and so I thought they might be less of a risk and a good way to start. But what I realized was that the studio apartments tended to be very small and therefore the converted one bedroom apartment would have been very small also. Mortgage lenders don't like apartments less than 30 square meters and most studios I came across were either 30 to 35 square meters. I I have purchased one bedroom apartments as small as 46 square meters and as big as 55 square meters and converted these into two bedroom apartments. Ideally, the bigger the better, but the one bedroom apartments are definitely the sweet spot. Lots of one bedroom apartments for sale and lots of sold two bedroom apartments that you can use to justify the end value. How does this impact the value increase? Is, does the biggest increase come from converting one bedroom? into two bed flats, can you get the same amount of increase or similar by converting two to three, three to four, etc.? The uplift or value created depends on two key variables. One, the purchase price. The best way to make sure you are getting the apartment for the best possible price is to look for tired and dated apartments that need work. These are less likely to appeal to residential buyers who want move into condition apartments. Using tools such as Property Log will allow you to see if there have been any price changes since the apartment was listed and also you can check how long ago the apartment 
apartment was listed. If the apartment has been listed a lot longer than others are shown and there have been price changes, then this could indicate that the owner might be willing to take a lower price. Two, the end value. The best way to boost the value over and above a normal refurbishment is to reconfigure. So add a bedroom. You could get this uplift or a value increase in either converting one bedroom apartments into two or even two bedroom apartments into three. But as mentioned earlier, in terms of getting the sold comparables, converting one bedroom apartments into two is optimal as there are lots of sold two bedroom apartments available when compared to three bedroom apartments. On the refinance onto the buy to let mortgage, the mortgage surveyor will look at sold two bedroom comparables within the last six months within a quarter mile of the property. It's just so much harder to bed down the values of a three bedroom apartment as they are less common. Does this strategy just work in central London or does it work in other areas of London as well? And how does this impact the value increase? This strategy could actually work anywhere depending on what you end up purchasing the apartment for and the values of two bedroom apartments in that area. It works well in big cities, but I've seen people complete these projects outside of London. When I first started, I was actually looking to do this this strategy closer to home and so actually viewed properties in Bedford. One bedroom apartments and I actually saw some apartments that had been one beds converted into two bedrooms. The reason I chose central London was because I'd left the city and was missing the buzz. I wanted to start to build a property portfolio in central London and by the process of elimination realized the only place I could start was with flats. I attended a property training course and on the course I remember one one of the trainers talking about someone in prime central London converting studio apartments into one bedroom apartments in areas such as Belgravia and Knightsbridge. I thought this was an amazing idea then and now I thought I could replicate the same idea but maybe not in these areas, even studios were very, very expensive here. So you said in one of your other videos that you convert two bed houses into three bed houses. Is this by using the same strategy? Yes, I purchased a two bedroom house in Bedford, which I converted into a three bedroom house. I purchased the house for 97,500 pounds. I moved the bathroom downstairs and converted the bathroom into a bedroom, ending up with a three bedroom house. Once I applied the B4R model on the refinance, the three bedroom house was valued at £160,000, which meant that I ended up with a three bedroom house with no money left in. So yes, this is similar to the one bed flats into two bed flats. What we are trying to do is convert two bedroom houses into three bedroom houses, thereby increasing as much as possible the value of the property. I used to buy three bedroom properties in Birmingham, but the uplift created by refurbishing these was minimal. And so I wanted to find an even better way to increase the uplift so converting two bedroom houses into three would be an excellent way to increase the value over and above a normal refurbishment. Um, so I've been phoning a few estate agents in, in central London to book viewings. Um, so whenever I tell them about this strategy, all, most of them come back with the same answer. And that answer is, it won't actually increase the value that much. You're not adding space to the property. The square footage is still the same. Have you had experience talking to agents where they tell you this? So it seems to me not, not a lot of them fully understand the strategy and the increase in value that it can actually bring. Yes, definitely. When I first started, I used to ask the agent what the apartment would be worth as a two bedroom apartment and then I would explain to them how I was going to create a two bedroom apartment. Every time I asked the question I got the same response. Rav, the apartment will be worth what you're paying for it. You are not adding any square footage and therefore it won't be worth much more. I've heard this so many times. I realized however that a two bedroom apartment costs more than a one bedroom apartment and so as long as I could show the surveyor a two bedroom apartment to value, then they would have to value it as a two bedroom apartment by looking at like for like comparables. For example, comparing it with other sold two bedroom apartments. I now just ask agents if they could send me some sold comparables of two bedroom apartments that will help me complete my due diligence. The other issue I found is that it's difficult for agents to visualize what you are planning on doing and therefore if they can't see it, it's harder to value. They have no idea what your level of refurbishment will be like. Are you going to spend £15,000 or £50,000? So they will struggle to value it as they can't see the end product. When you ask an agent to value 
value a property, they usually want to see it in its finished form so that they can give you a good idea of what they think it could be worth unless you're able to send them through computer generated images showing what the property will look like and the type of fixtures and fittings you are installing. I stopped telling the agents what I was planning on doing with the property and just focused on the property itself so I could negotiate a discount on the property. So for example, was the property tied and dated? Was it in need of a refurb? How long had it been on the market? Had there been any price movements on property log? Had there been any offers? And if so, roughly at what level? What were the circumstances of the owner? Was he in a chain or was the property owned by an investor? Was there any major works expected for the block that the apartment was in? What was the service charge and ground rent? Were these reasonable? All this information the agent can help with. So that's the questions I started to ask them. Let me just show you the projects we completed in central London, what we purchased them for and what they got valued at after only six months of ownership. Battersea, purchase price £237,150, valued after six months at £320,000. London Bridge, purchase price £330,000, valued after six months at £450,000. Vauxhall, purchase price £290,000, value after six months £390,000. Brixton, purchase price £240,000, value after six months £320,000. West Hampstead, purchase price £303,000 and value after six months £450,000. The average uplift created across these projects over a six month period has been £105,000, so it does work. Who were the best estate agents in London to find deals who fully understand the strategy and the value increase that this will bring? Best person is you. You will be best placed to find one bedroom apartments that you can convert into two bedroom apartments. You will need to do your own due diligence and rely on this to make a decision as to whether or not you feel the apartment you are looking at could work. I would never want to rely on anyone other than myself. You can work with agents to find one bedroom apartments and you can get their help to send you sold two bedroom comparables. Rightmove is the best tool out there to find these properties. You can set up alerts so that you get notified every time a property meeting your criteria is added to Rightmove. What agents can help you with is the following. They can tell you when the apartment was first listed, if there have been many viewings, what has been the feedback from people that have viewed, the number of offers received and roughly at what level, whether or not the owner is motivated, the level of service charge and ground rent and the length of the lease, if there's any development happening in the area in the near future that could help with capital appreciation, what the apartment could rent for and the type of tenant you are likely to attract. They will know which apartments are coming on, ones that might not be listed on Rightmove yet as they have only the keys and no photos, which apartments have fallen through in terms of the sale and the motivation of the owners. They have so much information that they can significantly reduce the time you need to do your due diligence. How do you go about getting the freeholders permission? Is it usually stated on their website? Do you phone them up? Do you email them? Um, also, how long does this process take? And at what stage do you contact the freeholder to get their permission? You will need freeholder consent when converting one bedroom flats into two bedroom apartments. Without this, you will struggle to refinance the apartment onto a buy to let mortgage. You can check the freeholder's website about what their requirements are when it comes to making alterations. Sometimes it does say what you can and can't can't do and other times you can contact them directly. When I get consent, I usually send them the floor plan as it is, a floor plan showing what it will look like. There is a tool called Smart Draw that you can use or even just use your phone to edit the before floor plan to add a box in terms of where the kitchen will go. I used to think that I needed professional architects floor plans, but that simply is not the case. The reason I started to use Smart Draw was that it comes across as a lot more professional. You usually get an answer quite quickly. Sometimes they won't speak with you if you are not the owner, in which case you can ask the current owner to ask the question by forwarding the email you intend to send and ask the current owner to find out if there's any reason consent would not be obtained. 
Sometimes, not all the time, they issue consent in principle and view the property prior to you completing the works and then might visit again once you have completed it so that they can check you did what you said you were going to do. They will want to make sure all the works are completed by competent tradespeople, so qualified plumbers and electricians. I usually get London Building Control to sign up on the works as this gives them extra assurances that the works have been completed in line with building regulations. Have you ever had to pull out of a deal because the freeholder has not given you permission to internally reconfigure the flat? To date, I have never had this issue. I tried to find out before exchange on the property whether or not consent will be granted. I usually buy these apartments using bridging finance and so the exit is the refinance onto the buy to let mortgage. I am looking to add as much value as possible so if I don't get consent, then I would be leaving a lot more money in on each project. What fees are involved in a project using this method? Valuation fees, solicitor fees, broker fees, consent fees, bridging costs. No architect fees. You don't need an architect. You can draw up the after floor plans using your phone. Smart draw or even get someone on fiverr.com to draw up these if you want something really professional looking. Consent fees. These vary anything from 100 to 250 pounds. The only additional fees are the consent fees if you compare this to a normal buy to let investor and the bridging fees. Between the time when you have completed the refurbishment and remortgaging the property, how do you get short term lettings? Do you put your property on Airbnb and other booking platforms or do you rent it out to contractors in the local area? I do long term corporate lets and so work with corporate agencies like Silverdor, Seiko and also insurance companies to get medium to longer term bookings prior to the refinance onto the buy to let mortgage. Would you be able to do this if you purchased the property using a buy to let mortgage because I know that some mortgage lenders uh, put restrictions on this that you can't put your property on places like Airbnb. I usually buy the properties on a bridge and then refinance onto a buy to let mortgage after six months of ownership. This is the best way to buy these properties as this method is more scalable. Buy to let mortgages are for investors looking to buy a property to rent out. What they don't like is you buying a property on a buy to let mortgage and then completing significant amounts of work to that property only then to refinance in six months time to another lender. You might be able to do this one once or twice, but if you keep redeeming your mortgage after six months, lenders will start to ask questions. And also, depending on the product you are on, you could incur early redemption fees. So watch out. The best model is to buy on a bridge and refinance onto a buy to let mortgage after six months of ownership, as this is what lenders are used to seeing. Um, so in one of your videos, you said that buy to let valuations are lower than the valuation if you were to if you intend to flip the property. I was just wondering how much lower is this? Buy to let surveyors will always be conservative and will base their value on sold prices. It can take up to six months for sold prices to hit right move, so there can be a disconnect between the value then and now. Also, the price the apartment is marketed at is not necessarily the price at which the apartment actually sells for. There will always be a level of negotiation and this can be either up or down depending on what's happening the market. For example, prior to COVID, you can negotiate 5 to 10% off the marketed price. But since COVID, the property market has been on fire and properties have been selling for more than the marketed price going to best and finals and resulting in bidding wars. It's really difficult to say what the difference is, but as long as you can provide sold comparables to justify the value as a two bedroom apartment, then you are in a really good position. I always meet the surveyor on the valuation day and provide him with a valuation pack, which includes photos of the property before and after, schedule of works, including money spent, sold comparables, usually three sold comparables within the last six months, within a quarter of the subject property. What we are trying to do is make his life as easy as possible and show that we have spent time and money on this apartment
environment and we know what it's worth. Can you please recommend builders, interior designers that, have used, that you've used for your previous projects? Yes, sure. I will send you details of who I use in central London. Can you please recommend a good broker for bridging finance uh, where you're able to then refinance on a buy to let mortgage six months later? Yes, sure. Our broker has helped us immensely. We work with one company who have a bridging and buy to let division who also talk to each other. This has massively helped me grow my portfolio as I was less nervous when it came to taking out a number of bridges at the same time. A lot of people think bridging is expensive, but the reason I love it is for the following. It's quick. I can complete a number of projects at the same time. As my experience grows over time, I'm able to look at bigger projects and therefore negotiate better rates. 